into this afternoon's webinar, Strategies for Reaching and Engaging Families from Underserved Populations. As you may be aware, one of the primary objectives of our current ARP funding cycle is engagement of underserved and vulnerable populations. Today we're going to be hearing from Maureen Dillon and several parents from the uh, ARP site at the University of California, Irvine, and they'll be discussing strategies for reaching and engaging families from underserved populations, as well as discussing the barriers, challenges, and successes that they've experienced at their site. So uh, at this point, I'll turn things over to Maureen and her team. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Cray and everyone at the ATNARP for asking us to present today. Um, I realize that there are many people from all over the place, all across the country, presenting, and so when I was putting this together, uh, I tried to keep in mind, um, you know, what sort of ideas uh, have been useful to us and the ways that they may apply to uh, different locations that may be trying to reach different types of other populations. So, um, just keep that in mind as we go through it and need to answer questions throughout or at the end of the presentation. Uh, I am expecting a couple of our parents to be joining us as well, and um, but as is usual in Southern California, I've gotten text messages that people are stuck in traffic, so uh, I, I think they'll be coming uh, a little bit into the presentation and I'll be able to um, be part of our discussion at the end. So a little bit about um, the two two of the groups that we have um, tried to especially reach out with in the past couple of years and uh, why we chose those groups. Then I'll be talking about some of the barriers um, that we see for uh, these groups, some of our successes and challenges, and providing some uh, suggestions. Uh, so the the locations up there are um, Mexico and Central America, uh, and then Vietnam, which represents the uh, communities of origin for uh, many of our families here at the center and in Orange County. So uh, in terms of immigrant communities in Orange County, uh, California has more immigrants than any other state. We have over 10 million immigrant uh, uh, residents. Half of the children in California have at least one immigrant parent, and so that's very significant. Not necessarily of these two communities, but um, we'll talk about why we're cho choosing these two communities. But understanding the immigrant experience and working with immigrant families is uh, a priority for us in California, given the population of our state. In uh, California, we tend to use the term Latino more than Hispanic, so from uh, this point going forward, uh, you'll hear that term, but I know in other parts of the country, uh, Hispanic is a term more, more frequently used. When we're talking about Latino families at our center, the countries of origin tend to be Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, and then uh, families that are from indigenous groups throughout those countries, uh, though obviously in other states um, the countries of origin can be quite different. In terms of our Vietnamese population, um, Vietnamese uh, represent the sixth largest immigrant group in the country, and uh, specifically in Orange County our uh, Latino population is around 33 percent and our Vietnamese population is around 6%, um, but uh, going forward, I'll show you a little bit more about the unique um, demographics of the Vietnamese community. So in general, these are some of the barriers that we understand um, are uh, factors to consider when we're working with immigrant families, and these barriers um, cut across uh, both of those communities in particular that uh, we're going to be talking about today. So uh, issues with um, income or having highly variable income from month to month, often in um, seasonal type uh, work um, or holiday uh, uh, tied work. We know that many of our immigrant families have uh, the parents had limited access to formal education, and so that presents 
uh, challenge with regards to literacy. Um, and in the medical world and the psychological field, we rely a lot on uh, questionnaires and parents providing us information um, based on filling out questionnaires. So that can present a significant challenge because even if a family's mailed a questionnaire in their own uh, language, they may not have the uh, literacy to complete it and can be quite overwhelmed. Uh, there's definitely language barriers with service providers, psychologists, pediatricians, uh, medical providers, school systems. And we know that in general, you know, large government agencies are supposed to be set up so that if somebody speaking a, um, a non-English language uh, calls on the phone, there should be access to translators uh, via phone. But we know from talking with families that those systems aren't always used or assumptions are made that a family is able to get by in English. Um, but when the conversation needs to go to a deeper level, that could be a significant challenge if the interpreters are not involved. Uh, there's definitely stigma and issues of, of denial um, that can prevent families from accessing services for developmental or mental health conditions. Um, I initially provided this presentation last year in June um, and uh, then reviewed it and revised it based on, um, on today's presentation. But even in June, um, fear of deportation or threats to family stability was, was a major issue for our families. And I would say in the past several months, um, that fear has, has increased. Um, there's a lack of knowledge and resources and social isolation for many uh, families. Uh, we find many families report that their child's language delays have been normalized um, typically by other providers in the community. So they hear a lot of things like, oh, well, a child's learning two languages, so they're just going to be behind. Um, and so even when a family is concerned, um, they may be uh, told to just uh, wait uh, for, for their child's language to come. Uh, there could be lack of family support, again, um, social isolation, lack of knowledge on typical child development that presents a barrier to families. Um, something we see particularly as an issue for families trying to receive ABA therapy is that there is often um, issues with housing in some of our immigrant communities where families are renting a room um, and perhaps sharing an apartment or a house with three or four other families. Uh, and while that is suitable for um, a place to sleep and, and to um, have shelter, sometimes it presents challenges when ABA therapists are trying to come out and families will um, perhaps use other language to say that, you know, the ABA therapy doesn't work for them when in fact um, it's because they feel that they can't have a therapist out to the house um, because of issues of shared housing with other, with other individuals. Many of our families um, experience transportation issues, and this can be compounded um, by issues with, you know, whether or not it's access to a car or access to um, driver's license, those kinds of things based on uh, immigrant status. Um, Many of our immigrant families, while the parents are employed, they are often employed in positions where there may no, not be any health benefits um, or any things like sick pay or vacation time. So attending appointments at our center, even though parents are very invested and particularly dads often want to come, um, but uh, if they don't go to work, they don't get paid that day. And sometimes the financial situation is so tight that it's not really a choice um, that they have um, to uh, get paid or, or not get paid for a day. Uh, we know that many of our immigrant families have uh, faced a lot of challenges in um, their, their life um, and their transition uh, from whatever country of origin to here. But often we don't ask families about that experience, uh, though it is important because there can be uh, trauma 
uh, or significant family separation that has been experienced. And it's important to acknowledge that uh, when talking uh, with the parents, particularly. We find that lots of our families don't um, understand how school systems work. Uh, and I would say that is a, a challenge, obviously, for many families. But even just knowing, for example, that children who are five or six would go to um, kindergarten or first grade, um, regardless of whether or not the child has a disability. So um, depending on where a family may have come from, there may not be schooling available for children with disabilities in their country of origin. And so they assume that because their child has a disability, uh, they may not be able to go to school here either, when in fact, as we know, that our schools are a, a great um, system of support to children with disabilities and a, and a critical part of that program. Uh, and then there can be challenges or of um, identification requirements, whether those are actual or perceived. Most recently, our, our center became aware that several families were turned away from a large pharmacy chain, uh, multiple um, stores, um, because they were being told uh, that they had to present a certain type of identification in order to pick up their child's medication. And um, we went to a state level uh, pharmacy board and got a local uh, legal aid society involved to work on this issue with us because we felt that the uh, pharmacy chain was imposing uh, unnecessary and unlawful regulations on our families and that was creating a problem for children accessing the medication that they needed. Um, unfortunately, a few weeks after we um, intervened, the large pharmacy change did issue a memo to all of its pharmacies in the state reminding them of all the ways that families can identify themselves and not to uh, restrict identification uh, unnecessarily. So um, these issues uh, do come up from time to time and sometimes you don't see them until you know a few families have, have run into them but trying to find solutions to support the families in in your community is, is critical. So I'm going to focus initially on our Vietnamese um, families and some of the work that we've been doing uh, with that community the past couple years. So uh, this is a map of just a small part of Orange County. And uh, there's a community which is often referred to as Little Saigon. It has around 200,000 Vietnamese res residents, and this represents 10% of the U.S. Vietnamese population. Uh, and um, so earlier I mentioned that while the Vietnamese population was about 6% of the Orange County community, uh, when you look in uh, this particular area, you can see that it, it presents uh, a significant percentage of the community. Uh, and I don't have a narrow to show you guys, but our, our center is located in Santa Ana, which you can see on the map um, on the right-hand side. So the community of Little Saigon uh, traditionally encompasses the cities of Garden Grove, Westminster, parts of Fountain Valley, as well as parts of Santa Ana. So we at our center have, uh, in the past, always had a Vietnamese uh, engagement. But in the past, we had a parent support model that uh, we had a parent who was working with us and uh, with Vietnamese, but unfortunately it had been ended due to some budget cuts. Um, and today we're talking about successes and challenges, so budget cuts are definitely one of those challenges to these efforts. Then in 2013, I was able to hire a social worker to join our team, and I found a trilingual social worker. So uh, Peter spoke English and Spanish and Vietnamese, and so you see the little unicorn over there to the right. That's to remind me how uh, unique and special that combination was. And uh, while Peter worked with us for a couple of years, we were able to collaborate with some agencies that specifically serve the Vietnamese community in Little Saigon, uh, including a group called OC Autism, which is headed up by a Vietnamese speech therapist and behavior therapist. Uh, and it has a therapy center as well as a nonprofit. Uh, entity. So we engaged on a process to uh, 
uh, see if we could develop a Vietnamese Family Advisory Committee back in 2015. Uh, we contacted 10 of our families that had sort of come to our attention as, as perhaps being uh, interested or good candidates for such an effort. And we, uh, Peter, set up times to meet with the parents. And one of the things that I, I remember in our discussions was that sharing stories was really important. Uh, and this will come up again later, but the idea of allowing families and making sure to give the time to allow families to share their story and experience, I think, uh, is, is pertinent to many of our families. So um, uh, we found out in talking with them that they were, you know, even though these children were patients at our center, um, that in, the, in, the, in general in the Vietnamese community, Folks were relatively unaware of our center. And another challenge that we heard over and over again was that um, it was difficult to get pediatricians in the Little Saigon community on board to make appropriate referrals uh, when families were expressing concerns about developmental issues or, or delays. And with these initial meetings, we uh, often found that families would stay after the allocated time to, to talk and to continue to share those stories. So unfortunately, um, last year in 2016, uh, Peter, well, fortunately for him, he took another position at UC Irvine, but unfortunately for us, um, we lost him as a social worker here at our center. Um, but I have good news in that we've continued to uh, offer educational events in, uh, in Vietnamese. So um, back in 2015, we did some introduction to autism series. And we had a combination of using Vietnamese speakers as well as uh, our own uh, team and using interpreters. In 2016, we were able to, through a collaboration we have with Chapman University, uh, recruit a school psychologist in, uh, uh, in training to work with us, who was Vietnamese, and to host a series of special education workshops for families. Um, and then in 2017, this year, um, this school psychologist who's working on her doctorate at this time and has a particular interest in um, understanding the resiliency and ways to support Vietnamese families, uh, has been collaborating with us to put on some uh, autism, we'll call them Autism 101 series or Autism Education series in Vietnamese. Now, um, what's been great is um, that uh, Kim has been able to really work around a schedule that would be most uh, convenient for families, as well as partnered with an uh, entity in Little Saigon to put on the training. So it was open to the whole community, not just uh, families at our center. Uh, there were about 30 parents that attended at each of the four weekend sessions. And it was held at a Vietnamese newspaper company, which is located in Little Saigon. And the other convenient thing about that was since the newspaper was hosting it, they were very happy to publicize um, our flyers and, and put them in their newspaper, which is widely read in the Vietnamese community here in Orange County. Uh, you can see the newspaper on the left-hand side, uh, and that's a, um, a screenshot I took from an article that they posted after the first day of training um, that had been hosted. And uh, we partnered with a pediatrician in Orange County, uh, Queen Q, that is um, committed to uh, supporting the Vietnamese community in some of the uh, uh, presentations, as well as our own our own staff. One of the exciting outcomes of the uh, four session series was that a group of parents got together to start their own Facebook page. And you can see the title of the Facebook page is the Vietnamese Parents of Children with Autism in Orange County. And so since February, they've been uh, communicating and posting things via the Facebook page, as well as we have a couple of staff here at our center that are um, connected to the Facebook page and able to post 
uh, ongoing trainings that we're offering as well. And our next Vietnamese um, educational event is coming up at the end of this week uh, and into next week. And it will be a class on managing tantrums. And we're going to, again, be able to use the newspaper space in Little Saigon um, because it's more convenient for families to go there than to come to our center. And you can see in the top right, our um, one of our behavior therapists, uh, Jennifer Wynn, uh, will be uh, providing the training in Vietnamese with support from our behavior director, Kelly, which many of you know. The other thing that's important to note about the training is um, you'll see on the flyer a little logo for the UniHealth Foundation. And so we've been trying to think creatively about ways to support these events. And uh, we do have some funding from the UniHealth Foundation to provide uh, more outreach to certain underserved populations. So just want to acknowledge um, that's been very helpful for our Vietnamese educational efforts. So now I'm going to switch over to working with our Latino families. Um, here at the center, we have a developmental behavioral pediatrician, Shun Park, who uh, is another unicorn we're so lucky to have. Um, so Shun speaks English and Korean and Spanish. Uh, and so she and I have been working together since the spring of 2015 to develop a, a Family Advisory Committee uh, specifically for Spanish-speaking Latino families. As uh, I don't speak great Spanish, but I speak enough to uh, help uh, Dr. Park in, in this partnership. So when we started meeting with our um, a group of families, four or five families from our center, we talked about different ways that we could uh, provide more outreach to underserved uh, families and Latino families at our center. And it sort of evolved that we could use a model of having a potluck. And the, um, the great thing about the potluck was uh, when we're trying to think of how to do more with not necessarily all the resources that we all wish we could have, um, we thought that food would be really important to have at an event, uh, but we had a limited budget. So we thought maybe we could ask families to help out with that. And um, we uh, encourage families to bring a plate to share. And that has made it possible for us to provide uh, less, perhaps less food than we might if we were hosting the event all ourselves, as well as giving a, families a way to um, really take ownership of the event and really make it their own and bring things that are um, meaningful to them into their to their family to share with others. So uh, we've had seven of these events to date. Uh, in Spanish, the word for hot luck is convivio. Uh, so we call them convivios. And uh, we are slotted to try to do these four times per year. I would say, in general, there is fairly minimal cost for the event. Um, the biggest cost is really the time of um, staff that may be needed to support the event. Uh, but the engagement from the community has been very high. We have usually anywhere from 15 to 25 families that are attending these events. And the event is for the parents and the children and any other um, family members that would like to join. So we have aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins um, coming to the event. The way that the events typically work is that the whole family arrives around 10 o'clock in the morning, and we check everyone in together, and everyone gets name tags. Uh, and after about 15 minutes, we take the children um, separately and go play uh, with great support from our behavior team. And then um, Dr. Park facilitates conversation, discussions, or provides presentations uh, to the group uh, for about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half. And then all the children return, and uh, we have our potluck all together as uh, a community. So these are just some photos in the top right. You'll see the parent discussion portion happening. In the bottom right, you see kids uh, playing. And in the bottom left, you see uh, 
our potluck time. Our last event, we had about 100 people total um, attending from uh, families to volunteers. So it was, it was a great success. Uh, again, you see the, the food out and um, families have really shared that they enjoy the, uh, the uh, meal time because it's often something during a busy week that families don't have time to share with each other. And on top of it, then they're sitting at tables with other families and able to continue the conversations um, that they've been having and able to have children getting to know each other and um, building social relationships as well. The other exciting thing that we've been able to do at the center is we have a research project going on through the ATN and ARP uh, on physical exercise and looking at um, positive, possible positive um, impacts on children. So uh, Dr. Garrick and other folks at our center developed a research protocol. Uh, but through the process of developing the research protocol, they actually met with our Latino Family Advisory Committee to talk about the different ways that they would be trying to implement the intervention and ways to maintain family participation. Because uh, for this particular study, families have to uh, 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 plan to attend several sessions of the intervention over the course of several weeks. And um, any family would have challenges uh, being able to show up uh, multiple weeks in a row. But with issues like transportation that we talked about earlier and um, job issues and things like that, we know that it's, it's particularly challenging for, for these families. Uh, so our Family Advisory Committee made suggestions to the research team. And um, in fact, one of our parents who's here today, Berlina um, Felipe, was able to uh, also write a letter of support for our grant, which was really exciting. So we were awarded the project. And then, of course, we had to recruit families for the project. And so we've been able to successfully recruit our participants in part because we've been doing the outreach events on Saturdays. And so we use some of the time to talk about the research study and invite families to participate. So um, we've had a great success. And this is just one um, photo. Uh, I've got many that would have been fun to share, but one photo of our exercise um, program going on in our in our classroom. So the same classroom that you saw a couple slides ago for our potluck um, can also work out be a workout room for families. In February, uh, we held the, our most recent um, potluck and discussion group. And we really felt that the parents were at a place where, um, because several of them had been attending over several um, over the, over the past several events that we wanted to provide more time for parents to talk. But we heard from our FAC parents that we really should provide opportunities for the dads to talk together and then the moms to talk together. And um, you'll see on the left, uh, the flyer says autism. Um, why doesn't my dad understand me? And that specifically was discussed in our FAC committee and our FAC parents, which is four moms and four dads, or four couples all together, um, uh, came up with the title and the concept for the event. And you can see in the top left, we had about 17 dads present for our Saturday event, uh, gathered around the table to talk. And they were. Um, the discussion was facilitated by Dr. Park, as well as our uh, three of our four uh, FAC dads that really um, were able to, again, share their own story and uh, talk um, openly about their experience and, and provide some guidance to other dads as other dads started to open up in the group as well. And then sort of in the middle, you'll see uh, the moms. We had about 22 or 23 moms that were um, present for our discussions that day, moms and grandmas as well. And below you'll see that we really did try to have a, a full house um, for our, our potluck that day. 
so this is a, um, a couple snapshots of our FAC, our Latino FAC. We host monthly meetings here at the center where we talk about upcoming events. Uh, most recently, I'd say over the last six months, we've had a lot of guests at our FAC meeting. So um, as this group has uh, really grown together and um, uh, demonstrated a lot of um, involvement here at the center, various programs at the center have been asking to come to meet with the group to get input. So I mentioned earlier our research team has come and met with our Latino FAC group. Our fund development staff have come to meet with the group. Our education and training directors come. Our um, lead speech pathologist has come. And folks from our learning network team have also come. And each time there's a conversation about um, what the needs of the community are, and then if there is going to be some sort of class or program that's going to be developed, how do we do that in a way that is meaningful for the community? So for an example, our speech pathologist uh, came and said um, she is uh, wanting to teach parents about play and the importance of play in uh, working with children, young children with autism. But she wasn't sure what sorts of games or um, ways to engage children would be most culturally relevant. And so she was soliciting ideas from our Latino FAC so that she could make sure to tailor the presentation and the suggestions that she was providing to things that would be meaningful to the community. Another thing that I'd say is really important about our FAC um, is that with Dr. Park and I and the four um, families that are um, attending, there's really a lot of support and guidance that is provided in these meetings and a sense of community that's been built. Um, so I will come with an agenda um, to the meeting, and parents will also come with an agenda to the meeting. But we make sure to provide time for people to talk and share, um, both before and after the meeting, about what's going on in their lives and um, the, the struggles and that they're having as well. And I will say that this has been um, um, Something that our guests have also uh, been able to see when they've come and attended our FAC meetings because uh, they somewhat expect that it will run like a typical meeting where you just come in, say hi to everyone, and get to your agenda. But uh, that is not the way that we typically run our, our FAC meetings. So um, we say, you know, there's going to be sort of warm-up time. We'll have some snacks. And, and then after everyone's had a chance to sort of check in with each other, then we'll try to get down to business. So we make sure to provide time for that. The other thing that we have been doing um, is that the center's been supportive of um, providing um, gift cards. Uh, to we, I just get them at Target um, to our FAC parents. And um, for me, this is a way to, uh, you know, just really acknowledge that there is a lot of time and planning that goes into them coming to um, the meetings here at the center, that they need to plan their schedules, um, maybe uh, get child care or bring their kids and things for them to do. So if the Target cards help um, to get coloring books or Play-Doh, um, or toys or things like that to keep them entertained, uh, we definitely want to support the parents in doing that. And another fun thing that we did this year is that we had our first holiday party, um, which was actually hosted at the home of one of our um, couple or one of our families. And um, again, was a potluck style event where everybody brought um, uh, food uh, to share and we had a really great time. So it was a really nice small event um, compared to our usual potlucks, which have anywhere from uh, 60 to 100 people. This one, I think, was around 20, 25, uh, which, is, which is small for us. Uh, but we, we really enjoyed having that time together. Um, I'm going to play a little uh, video from our FAC. I do apologize in advance. Unfortunately, the way I have the presentation set up, I wasn't able to embed it for you guys to have the best sound experience. Um, most of it is in Spanish, um, but I will give you a brief summary at the end, but I did uh, want to have a chance to share this with you. 
or I'm going to try my best. Estoy en este grupo porque me fascina abrir estas puertas donde me van a ayudar completamente para seguir adelante con siguiendo la noticia. Estoy muy agradecido, muy feliz de poder participar en estas reuniones juntamente con los profesionales del centro y los padres para poder apoyar y dar nuestras ideas y opiniones. ¿Cómo poder hacer actividades y cosas que ayuden a nuestros niños y también que dan que den ayuda a los, a los padres. Este, yo soy un papá voluntario de, en el centro de autismo. Él es mi hijo Alex Felipe, él me lo diagnosticaron con autismo y venimos a las pláticas de padres voluntarios cada, cada una vez cada mes y pues estos son mis hijos y lo que estamos trabajando es para ayuda para él. Hola, mi nombre es Perlina Felipe, soy mamá de Alex Felipe. Él ha estado diagnosticado con autismo. The reason why I'm here is because I want that more for more of the family to have the services that we are likely getting. I want to help other families because when I started my journey with my son, we didn't have a lot of services or a lot of things that would help my husband understand in Spanish what was going on with my son. So I I want to be part of this new movement that would help other Hispanic families with um other um other families to get services like I am. We are lucky that I speak English, he speaks Spanish, but it's hard to make them understand what doctors are trying to explain to me. And um, I'm happy to be in this group. We are a great group. We love to come here. We love the experience with Dr. Park and Marie. And um, I hope that this can not only be our, this can not only be a project that our center is doing, but other centers around the country is doing too. Thank you. So I know most of that was in Spanish and um, not sure if you guys were um, able to to hear it so well. I will say it is on the uh, face, um, I'm sorry, it is on the YouTube channel for um, this group and so you'll be able to check it out there. But hopefully you sort of got the message that um, these parents are very committed to uh, helping to open doors as the, the first dad was saying to other um, families in the community and uh, through their own experience partnering with us uh, to make sure that we find uh, ways to do that. So um, I want to spend the last part talking a little bit about challenges and suggestions and also um, open up to uh, Berlina, one of our FAC parents that you saw at the end of the video who's here with me today. Efforts for engaging uh, underserved families, in my experience, are uh, driven and especially successful if you can identify a couple of people at your site. And I would encourage you to think broadly um, if this is a new endeavor or if this is something you're already doing, um, thinking about who at your site you are uh, involving because, uh, you know, at our site, we if we uh, consider just based on perhaps um, language uh, ability of some of our physicians or our psychologists, we would be more limited, but when we start to think about staff that support our center uh, or staff that work under some of our lead clinicians, uh, we have a, a lot broader ability to serve families from diverse backgrounds, and I think those um, staff, uh, either support staff or uh, staff working under lead clinicians, can be supported and mentored to do this this work as well. I would say from my experience working with the Vietnamese families, uh, it's an effort that we continue uh, to work very hard on, but staff transitions uh, can definitely impact the effort, and so uh, there was a, a challenge once um, the Vietnamese-speaking social worker left to figure out how we would re-engage that community and keep some of um, the hard work 
uh, going. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to do that, but we do have to be uh, creative. Uh, and, and again, if it's tied to one particular staff, that can be particularly challenging. I would say start small. There may only be one or two families that you can think of off the top of your head that you want to um, sit down with and meet. And so I would say encourage you to do that. You can hold individual meetings, perhaps in the community, go get coffee somewhere. That may be more effective than a, for, a more formalized putting a call out or um, asking families to come to you. That definitely was the case with working with our Vietnamese family. Uh, time invested is incredibly worthwhile for me professionally and personally. I continue to learn so much uh, every time I meet or work on projects with with our FAC. I would say that the your time frame or your organization's time frame and the community's time frame can be quite different. And so being patient and persistent are so important. Um, where we are at now, you know, uh, I'm so um, pleased and uh, surprised, but I would say that getting to this point has taken um, quite a long time and really um, uh, working at, you know, the pace that works best for the families is, is so important. And that being said, don't, don't say, oh, well, you're going to try something for a year because that's just not enough time to actually um, get there. You hopefully can commit for a bit longer period than that. When funding is a barrier, as is often the case, start small. Do what you can. See if you can have a potluck. Um, we have tried multiple ways to get funding. We've recently applied to a grocery chain that um, serves the Latino community and has a few stores here waiting to see. You know, $5,000 here or there can definitely make the difference of, of hosting a few events in a year. Uh, if you only go after the large funding and you don't get it, you may never get started with, with something like this. Um, I talked to you a little bit earlier about the importance of telling stories and just want to reiterate that communication styles can be really different, um, but uh, making sure to give time for stories and know that um, verbal or phone or face-to-face -face meetings may be more effective than written or email. Uh, that's definitely the case with, with um, the families that I'm working with, and so making the time for those verbal or phone conversations is really important. Uh, and then lastly, that solutions and opportunities can be so creative and meaningful to the community when the community offers them. Uh, so again, sitting down with the community um, and having those conversations, maybe just starting with one or two families, uh, would be our suggestion. So I want to thank you all for your time today and let you know that Berlina, one of our Latino FAC parents who's bilingual in English and Spanish, is all, also here with me. And we're open to take any um, questions, or if there's no questions, I'll uh, encourage her to share a little bit of her experience as well. Thank you so much, Maureen and Berlina. Um, this is a really, really great presentation, and I think that you've given us some really good ideas for other sites and other individuals on the call to start working with some of their um, populations. So I would like to encourage folks, if you have questions, to type them into either the questions box or go ahead and unmute yourself to talk. Um, we don't have any questions right now, so if Berlina wants to share, then I think that would be excellent. Hi, um, I'm Berlina. Share about your son. Well, I started coming to the center because of my son, Alex. Well, Jesus Felipe. Um, we call him Alex. And um, we, when we started, we were lost. I was lost. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, this was the very first time anybody in my family was diagnosed with any neurodevelopmental disorder or anything. And um, my parents didn't really understand it and kept telling me that, you know, doctors always label kids and stuff like that. I They told me not to take them to speech therapy and stuff like that, but I didn't listen. 
I kept going and I kept taking him to therapy. I mean, even today I have like five, six therapies a week and I don't mind. I, oh, I come here, I help here whenever I can. I go to my daughter's school and help whenever I can. I mean, I'm really busy, but um, this center has made such a difference for me and him. We, we, when we started, my husband didn't understand what was going on. He, he um, went into a box. He filled himself in there and didn't want to recognize the problem my son had. Kept telling me that everybody was telling me something that was not there, that my son was normal. And I saw those differences that, I mean, I have a nephew that is, what, three, three four days younger than my son and was already meeting some of his um, hitting, what do you call it? His, yeah, his milestones that my son wasn't. So I kept going. I came here and I heard about the SAC and I was like, I want to join. I want to learn as much as I can to help my son. I want to even helping other people will help me um, learn from their experiences so I could try new things with my son and if they like I was told in the beginning if they don't work go to the next thing not what whatever works with one kid will never work with the other kid they're all different so I tried it and some of the stuff we talked about in the meetings with other parents have worked for my for me and other things haven't so I mean this is a great thing that we're doing other parents are happy with it other parents have told us that this has made a difference in their life too. They were rejected by other family members just as I was. And being here with other parents that have kids like theirs or like ours, they say they feel like they're in like a big family. We understand each other. We don't mind if our kids are screaming their lungs out like around us. We we deal with it. We know that their kids are like that and even outside of here, other I've met other parents with that have um, kids with autism that probably are going right now that are, just got diagnosed with their kids through the same thing I went with my son two years ago. And I, one of them like really stuck to me. I told her, you know what, don't worry about it. This is normal. And she's like, you're the first person that's told me that my son's um, behavior is normal. I'm like, because I went through it. My son went through it. So I don't see it as a bad thing. I see it like it's normal for that them to act the way they are to be crying because they don't want to do something it takes time for them to understand or at least to get used to something so I help parents whenever I can I I try to encourage them to like you know your kids are not different everybody needs to learn that they are the way they are and they're normal that's what I say to, I said to her that day she she it, it put a big smile in her face and she's a friend now <laughs> So, I mean, I love being here, and I love helping as much as I can. And I thank Maureen and Dr. Park for it, because if they wouldn't have started this, then we wouldn't have been here. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Berlina. Yes, thank you so much for sharing um, the kind of the work that you guys are both doing and the outreach and the real kind of sense of community that you are you all are building at your site is so wonderful to hear, um, and I'm really hoping that some of the activities and things that you guys have talked about, others can take those ideas and use them to work with their populations as well. Um, so just thank you guys both for, for sharing. Um, we don't have any questions, but um, if you either of you have any final thoughts, we can um, wrap up the session just a few minutes early. And I'll just remind everyone that a recording of the session will be available um, on our network YouTube page as well as the message from the Latino FAC parents that Maureen shared. So everyone can access that afterwards. I have something else to say. Let's not forget about the dads. That is really important. Most most people try to educate moms. or They don't make an effort to include the dads and I feel like if the dads will understand what is going on with their kids, especially in our community, Hispanic people, the men are too macho and they don't want to, like, 
they say, you know what, no, you're wrong and this and that. And if we include the dads in most of our meetings, and we have had a great success of a lot of the dads coming to our meetings and being here, I mean, that is the most important thing because I'm, as a mom, I mean, personally as a mom, if my son, something new happens to him, you know, I get on board, I do what I have to do, but it takes the dads a lot longer to understand, which is really frustrating because you would wish that they would be as fast as you, but they're not. So, I mean, that is one of the most important things. Include the dads in anything you guys do. It's really, really important. It will help a lot of the moms, too. Thanks, Marlena. Thanks everyone for your time today and please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions or want to uh, brainstorm about ways to work with families at your site as well. Keep up the good work. Thank you and thank you both again for presenting and for sharing your stories and thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope that everyone has a great rest of your afternoon.